dick blood. That really, that really stuck with me. Do you think that's a valid Scrabble word? Or? No. All right. So all of these poems are partially based on somewhat true stories. Um, the first one is called How to Use the Lonely Planet Guide in South America. Never try to do anything the way the book says to do it. It is likely the rules, prices, and routes have all changed since the articles were written three months ago. Never count on the book to explain just how absurd a bus ride in the Peruvian Andes might be. Eight cents adjectives, eight cent adjectives won't smell like half frozen mud or press against your chest with thin air, thin air or sell you giant corn boiled in a copper pot with a slab of salty cheese. The book will not tell you to take the giant corn and shove it inside your jacket to stay warm when 15,000 feet above sea level. Never pay a fee, tax, or additional charge the book does not mention. The book, though vindictive, is frugal. You can rely on it to save you money. Never stay in a hostel recommended by the book. It is likely they have become lazy and or raised prices since receiving this international stamp of approval. Also, never stay in a hostel recommended by the taxi driver who picked you up at the airport bus or train station his relative is the dueño and the driver will return later for his kickback <laughs> never describe places using adjectives you find in the book everyone you met just read the same page they all know that the air in baños ecuador is charged with sexual energy <laughs> regurgitating eight cent a word descriptions will not get you laid the book is heavy and bulky. It takes up valuable space. When you leave a country behind, tear out these pages and leave them somewhere where the next traveler can find them. This next poem took place in Iguazu, Argentina. Her name was Maria, and her eyes were two hazel moons pecked with celestial impacts. She was beautiful in a delicate and fragile way, and she kept talking about cocaine. I thought if I bought her cocaine, she would sleep with me. We walked along just us two under the palms, escorted by so many butterflies. There was a man against a tiny wall on the sidewalk that passed the local bank. He wore a frayed hat, had frayed hair, and missing and pointed teeth. His brown eyes did not sparkle, but he knew what she wanted. We paraded, we paraded around town, just a three, whistling at taxis, waving, pointing, spinning in circles, finally stopping at a bar, La Buena Onda, with red plastic tables and chairs that molded to stack perfectly. I sat staring deep into Maria's eyes. Her lip quivered with fear as the man smacked around a nine-year-old boy who sat playing with a knife. The hot, moist air, clothes sticking to our skin. The bar's quiet solitude was not at all romantic. In the same way, the chalky powder that made us sneeze, that burned our noses and throats was not at all cocaine. <laughs> Before we left, our guide offered me meth. From the bottom of my heart, he said, and there was something so touching about the way he poked his dirty finger into his chest. <laughs> All right, so the next uh, poem is in the, the voice of First Lady uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, the first time she saw the Iguazu Waterfalls, which is on the Brazil of Paraguay, Argentina, and Brazil. So. <laughs> Poor Niagara. <laughs> All right. <laughs> this next poem took place in... in Sandor, Peru. The van was bouncing hard on the dirt road and I didn't know quite where to get off so I straightened my back to stare from the window and into the glistening lake. The water in the lake was moved by little bits of wind that crushed the reflection of the green hills and shiny white clouds into a pace that was blue, dark, and sloshing. But by the shore, there were banks of reeds that set apart smooth little channels of water made into imperfect liquid returns of static figures under the Andean sun. Pieces of foam oozed from holes in the van's upholstery, and I tore at them, rolled them into little spongy balls that I let fall to the floor. Across from me, an old Quechua woman sat smiling softly with her dark eyes as I dug out the bare wires behind the cracked leather of my seat while the driver called out stops and we rolled along and I still didn't know quite where to get off. All right, this is the last one. It's about uh, formalities in Peru. 
buying a mummy. If you are hiking to pre-Incan ruins in Peru and an old man emerges from behind a whitewashed building to offer you unfiltered tap water in a tin cup, always accept. You will suffer a serious case of diarrhea, but if you do not accept this water, he will never offer to sell you a mummy. <laughs> Important, always feign interest in purchasing said mummy. Nod knowingly and smile while he crouches into a ball crosses his arms across his chest and lowers his head. This is the universal sign for mummy. And just to demonstrate real quickly. <laughs> it's like that, that's, that's the mummy sign. All right. Inquire as to the type, size, state, distance, and location of mummy. Drive a hard bargain. If he says 100 soles, come back with 50. Settle on 70 and sip your tin cup thoughtfully. You will need these items, tobacco, jewelry, and coins to offer the mummy as pittance for the disturbance, boots with good support for the severe trails, a flashlight, a shovel, a means to wrap and transport your mummy. A lack of these items is the easiest way to break your verbal contract for said mummy. In the end, the removal and disturbance of a sacred ancestor is a flagrant violation of moral and legal boundaries. Tell him you'd love to see the mummy, but explain you won't be able to take it with you, at least not today. With a toothy smile and friendly wag of the finger, he will refuse your counteroffer. Hand him back the empty tin cup, thank him for his time and his water, and continue on your way, mummyless. Thank you.